My name is Monica McCormick, and I come to you from downtown. I'm working at NYU in the Office of Digital Scholarly Publishing, where I work for both NYU Libraries and NYU Press. I'm very happy to be here today to welcome you to Invisible College, That Camp as Scholarly Society, which is the second to last event in the joint series of um, events from the Research Without Borders and the Digital Humanities Speaker Series for this academic year. Um, the final event will be next week on Tuesday, April 10th. We'll feature Eric Waken from Columbia's Rare Books and Manuscripts Department talking about his Digital Civil War project. So we'll give more details about that at the end as we have them. Um, we'll be working today with the following format. I'll give a brief introduction and then Tom will speak and then we'll have time later for discussion and questions from all of you. Um, and because we're videotaping the event, we're hoping everybody will um, stand up and ask questions at the end of, the, um, of Tom's talk using the um, microphone in the middle so we can capture on the video your question. Um, so Tom Scheinfeld is the managing director of the Center for History and New Media, which is known as CHNM, uh, and also the research professor of history at George Mason University. He's, he wears a very large number of hats. It's impressive to read about his, uh, his accomplishments. He's a historian of science, a public historian, and a leading practitioner of the digital humanities. He received his BA from Harvard University and an MA and a PhD from Oxford University. He has lectured and spoken widely on the history of popular science, the history of museums, history in new media, and the changing role of history in society. He's worked on both traditional and digital exhibitions at places ranging from the Colorado Historical Society, the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, the Louisiana State Museum, the National Museum of American History, and the Library of Congress. Tom blogs at Found History, and in that blog, I think he, he really usefully demonstrates his range as both an admin, as an administrator, a hacker, a scholar, um, an analyst of the digital humanities scene. So topics that he's blogged about include things, very pragmatic things like how to use useful short bursts of organized uh, uh, activity to create really pr useful tools like the One Week, One Tool project. Um, he's written about how to sustain innovation and innovative institutions re while relying on soft money. Um, he's written about whether the digital humanities reputation as being nice is a, um, and collaborative is a reflection of the fact that the digital humanities are focused really on method rather than on theory. And he's also written about larger theoretical questions such as you know, the, what he's referred to as the where's the beef question for digital humanities. When is the digital humanities going to be able to produce theoretical advances and how we, um, and he's placed that question in really useful historical context. So he, he thinks and writes about a lot of things. Today he's going to be um, speaking to us about that camp, the humanities and technology camp. So I will let him take it from there. Well, thank you very much, Monica. Um, it's a really a pleasure to finally get to meet you. Um, thank you, Catherine. I want to thank, because we're on video, I'll thank Barbara, who couldn't be here, for, for putting all this together. Um, how many people have been to that camp before I? Good. Not too many of you. All right. So we have uh, fresh meat. Um, that's, that's a good thing. Um, I, I do write and talk about digital humanities uh, now and again, but I, the, most of what I do at the center is uh, project management work. I, you know, make things, make software, make um, make uh, online exhibitions, make teaching resources, um, and I think that camp and, and in general the, the the center has a very kind of practical, pragmatic uh, tradition where we try to you know get stuff done, um, and that camp very much comes out of out of that that pragmatic uh, culture uh, of the center. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about it today and maybe hopefully entice some of you to uh, attend one of the that camps that are going to be happening happening in the area over the next oh, 12 months or so. I think there are going to be two or possibly three um, New York area that camps um, at least. So uh, hopefully by the end of this you'll be convinced. Um, so these days when uh, we talk about things like 
scholarly societies, scholarly publishing, scholarly communication, uh, the word that we most often hear is uh, this word crisis. Um, <laughs> the crisis in scholarly communication, the crisis in scholarly publishing, uh, the crisis among scholarly, uh, scholarly uh, societies. Um, this uh this this point of view was um it was on display just this week uh in the chronicle of higher ed um which started an article um with this uh with this lead um will disciplinary societies become the bowling leagues of academe um making reference to uh to to bowling alone the the early 2000s thesis um about the breakdown of civic life in america um you know, I, I think that's a, you know, that, that's an enticing lead. Um, people read articles about gloom and doom and disaster. I don't share that, that, um, that gloom and doom outlook. Um, but, uh, you know, my skepticism of it shouldn't uh, mean, should, shouldn't take it to, to mean that um, there's nothing to it. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Scholarly societies have their problems. Their membership is aging. Um, they're having trouble uh, gaining new new recruits. Um, attendance at annual meetings is by and large down. Um, journals, which are a mainstay of their work, are facing uh, competition from new business models, new uh, new digital business models, especially. Um, and uh, for many of these societies, especially societies in the humanities, uh, their finances are really in the tank. Um, so the problems are real. Um, but I don't think these economies, these economics, these, these market measures tell the whole story. Um, and I think that people working, the smart people working at these uh, disciplinary societies um, know this. Uh, Jim Grossman from the American Historical Association uh, was quoted in that same article uh, saying that the results of their research, of their surveys, and actually a um, uh, uh, former GMU grad student who's the, who's, uh, 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 can't remember his title, but he's like second at the AHA. Rob Townsend um, does a lot of research on the history of the discipline, the history of history, um, and also a lot of work on uh, looking at the state of the discipline today. And they, so they do a lot of quantitative research about the state of history and the state of the or, their organization. Um, and one of the things that they found is that their membership and even people who are, you know, sort of not have been members, will be members, go to the meeting, you know, that, that there's the kind of the membership and then there's that, that broader community around it. Um, those historians think that um, the AHA should be doing more or less what it is doing. Um, and so this crisis um, is it can be taken two ways one one that you know there are some real measurable problems with scholarly societies but the other that you know people generally like these things and um and and so i think what we need to um interrogate then is well if they like what scholarly societies do but the scholarly societies are having a trouble making a go of that we should kind of take a look at what these societies do and where that mismatch um, is happening. For most people, the main thing that, or their kind of most direct contact with the scholarly society is through the conference, through the annual meeting, right? That's where you hand over your credit card for the most part. You know, that's where you book the plane ticket, you, you spend the money, um, and you go to the conference. That's sort of your most direct connection with the organization. Um, for uh, for the big societies in the in the especially for the you know the MLAs and the AHAs, um, but even even for the smaller societies um, by 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 proportion, um, these meetings tend to be large meetings. You know they attract lots of people. Um, they are infrequent. Um, they're usually once a year. Um, they're located in a very specific place and time. You know, it's like San Diego 2012 or, you know, Austin uh, 2014. Um, they're expensive, very expensive, both to the organization and to the attendee. Um, and, and they're a ton of work. Um, so, you know, these characteristics, big, infrequent, uh, isolated, expensive, uh, lots of work, 
you can see why in a kind of fast moving information environment, those adjectives are not things that are going to be, you know, widely attractive, although, you know, they people continue to go to these things. So but you can start to see why those characteristics, there's a it's kind of mismatch even just there. Um, and thinking about uh, uh, you know what what these organizations are doing. Another thing that these organizations do is they generally have journals. Um, probably the scholar's most frequent contact it, with the the organization is through is through the journal. Um, it's the you know it's the thing that it's the, you know, it's not the thing they go to once a year. It's the thing they come back to over and over again in their research. Um, even if they don't read it cover to cover when it arrives on their doorstep, um, they do go back to the articles, to the back issues. They do you know look at JSTOR and all the stuff that's there. Um, you know, viewed from this crisis point of view, um, these journals tend to be uh, rigid um, in terms of their format. You know, they have you know, they have a short introduction. They have a few 10,000 word essays, you know, scholarly articles, then they have some book reviews, you know, I mean, it's very kind of rigid in terms of the format. Um, they're slow in terms of time to publication. I mean, especially if you consider when the first idea pops into the scholar's head to the time when the journal arrives on their colleagues doorstep, even if that, you know, that colleague may be in the next office to them, um, you know, the, the time um, to communicate that idea is extremely long. Um, they're inefficient in terms of the distribution. Um, as I said, like the time to communicate the idea from one office to the next, um, you know, it goes through, in terms of the distribution channels, it goes through like several middlemen and lots of different kind of digital formats. And even, even when it's an e-publication, you know, I mean, it, it's created, you know, it's created in, in, on paper note cards, then it's put into a Word document, then it's turn into a PDF and I mean, you know, lots of these different stages of, of kind of ineff inefficient distribution. Um, and, you know, they tend to be kind of stodgy in terms of the content. Um, if you just kind of like look at the landscape of, of information out there, you know, via a Google search, um, you know, some of the kind of stodgiest, you know, boring um, prose is going to be found in, in these journal articles. Not that the research isn't good, but that, that it's just, it has a kind of stodginess um, um, to it. And, you know, just, just from this crisis point of view. Um, you know, the last thing, the last sort of characteristic of these scholars, scholarly societies, the last way that, um, you know, when Jim Grossman talks about what we do, they do membership. Um, and, you know, Jim said in that article, part of the value of scholarly societies is a civic appeal. There's no doubt. It's the nature and value of citizenship. Um, so they offer some kind of intangible benefit of representation or advocacy or community, you know, this kind of membership identity in, in, in a profession, in an organization. Um, you know, but viewed from the point of view of crisis, this, this, this intangible membership community identity thing is kind of too weak a market driver to, to, to make a difference to this crisis, um, to the crisis in, in, in scholarly societies. Um, oh, right. The last thing that they do very well. Um, they do committees uh, very well. Uh, endless committees, right? Um, uh, exhausting committees, uh, arrogant committees, um, uh, ineffectual committees, right? Uh, you know, this is unfair. A lot of those committees do very good work. I'm part of several of these kinds of committees uh, myself. Um, but for the people who don't sit on those committees, um, and, you know, even for some of the people who do, it's all too easy to sort of see the management and governance structures of scholarly societies in these negative terms, that these are just, these are these, these bodies that do a lot of talking around problems and don't solve problems, don't offer much, they kind of get in the way. Um, so all of these structures, um, all of these structures of scholarly societies um, they, they, they start to seem less like what the scholarly societies were intended to do and more like overhead, right? They, they, they seem to kind of get in the way of what the scholarly society intended to do, that the structures have taken over the purpose. You know, the structures were created for a purpose, and now the scholarly societies kind of exist not to serve the purpose, but to kind of perpetuate the structures. Um, and I think that's a lot of what people see when they see crisis in scholarly societies. Uh, that's, that's what they see. 
knowing very little about the landscape of scholarly communication and, and academic uh, organizations when we started that camp in, in 2008, although, I mean, knowing what kind of every scholar knows from, you know, going to the annual meeting and participating in these on committees and stuff, um, you know, this was our perspective, these kind of negative perspectives. This was our perspective when we, we launched that camp in, in 2008. Um, that the prevailing activities of scholarly communication um, too often served as functional roadblocks to scholarly communication, that the structures were getting in the way of the communication. Um, that's sort of what we, our, our prevailing viewpoint. I mean, that's actually too fancy uh, a formulation. Um, when we started that camp, we actually kind of started it on a whim. We were a bunch of uh, us, especially a couple of graduate students. We were sitting around the developers table and um, thinking that, um, you know, these conferences, they carry way too much over. You know, I think, you know, we had been back from a couple of meetings and just the thought that these, these things carry way, way too much overhead when all people really want to do is get together. They cost too much money. That was kind of the first insight. Um, you know, why should it cost an organization tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars, and certainly cost the membership hundreds of thousands of dollars? Like you think of all the money spent on, on an MLA meeting, not by just by the MLA itself, but by all the members who spend, you know, thousand dollar plane ticket to get to Seattle or, or, or whatever. Just the amount of money that's spent to host one of those meetings. Um, you know, we, we thought like, why should it take that much money just to get together? Um, why should it take years of planning? I mean, these, these big meetings, um, some of them are, ha are, they have to plan them 10 years in advance. You know, the, the, you, book the, you book the hotel five, certainly five, possibly even 10 years in advance to get, you know, the Hilton in Chicago uh, in 2020. Um, you know, why does it need to take full-time staff when you like, you know, you can email a bunch of people to get, you know, we, we all organize like events, right? Parties and other things, and it doesn't take a full-time staff. We get together. Um, you know, why should it take 200-page programs? Why should it take tote bags? All of this seemed like overhead um, to to us. Um, you know, I'm being really unfair here in the first part of my presentation. I'm going to be much fairer in the second part of my presentation. Um, we also felt that there was you know, sort of too much talking at these meetings, you know, these big meetings and everybody goes to them and what do you do? You know, you do this, right? Someone talks at you um, and you listen and you wait and wait and wait and wait so you can talk at them at your session. Um, you know, that's the, that's the model. Um, and we thought that, um, you know, why should we spend so much energy sort of talking at each other? Why can't we just kind of get together to talk about our ideas, share ideas, solve problems, um, share work in progress. Um, you can see this is like, this is definitely like dorm room kind of late night conversation kind of stuff, right? This is, this is, this is, this is how, how this happened. Um, uh, we also thought in terms of overhead, there's like too much psychological overhead at these meetings. Um, there's too much tension, um, too much hostility. There's way too much anxiety for younger members of the profession and way too much ego for older, more established members of the profession. You know, like, why can't we all just get along? Um, this was our, this, this was, this was our thought. Um, and that camp's ground rules which are, you know, in one form or another or another red at most of the beginning, you know, this is, becomes kind of theological, but they're kind of red at the beginning of, of most of that camps, um, uh, you know, reflect these reactions to, to scholarly meetings. Um, and, and I think it's worth it to take, take a minute to try to understand them. Um, even if I'm, you know, and, and they're, they're, these ground rules are really framed in kind of in opposition to um, the, 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 the values of traditional scholarly conferences. Um, even if that scholarly conference, that imaginary scholarly conference, is something of a straw man. So first of all, that camp is uh, fun, right? So we set up this idea, that camp, this new thing that we're going to invent, that camp, it should be fun. And that means, you know, no reading papers, no, none of this. 
no PowerPoint. Like this is very on that camp. And in fact, like this is actually a very fancy room for for that camp. And I'm actually, you know, I'm very grateful for that. You know, this is not the kind of room that that camp's normally held in. Um, but you know, no PowerPoint presentations, no extended project demos, and no grandstanding. You know, none of this pontificating that that I'm doing right now. Um, that camp was meant to be productive. Um, so following kind of from the no papers rule, um, we're not. We don't go to that camp to, to listen and be listened to. Uh, we go to work. We go to that camp to work, to participate, um, to solve problems, to start new projects, uh, to cure writer's block, uh, forge new collaborations. Whatever, whatever work means to the attendee, that's what should happen at that camp. And then that camp is, uh, is, is collegial, um, kind of also following from the fun rule. Um, you know, everybody at that camp should feel free to participate equally, that there's no, you know, management and staff, there's no full professors and grad students and associate professors and assistant professors and adjunct faculty. You know, none of those kinds of distinctions should exist at that camp. And there should be no kind of petty bullshit of the kind where, you know, after I give my talk, you guys all try to pick it apart and find out where I went wrong. And, you know, we don't do that. We help each other solve problems. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that we all, you know, you can never identify where someone has taken a wrong step, but it shouldn't be like, you know, I as the speaker prove how smart I am, and then you as the, as the audience member in the Q&A try to prove how stupid I am by comparison with you. You know, that kind of dynamic, we, we tried to avoid at that camp. So with those values in mind, um, we, try to imagine a new kind of meeting. And being a digital humanities shop, we took, um, we took uh, large inspiration um, from the culture of Silicon Valley um, and a set of bar camps, foo camps, unconferences that were, um, that were organized in Silicon Valley in the, uh, in the um, early part of the 2000s. And these were events where um, they didn't have preset agenda, um, they, they, uh, they, they didn't have, you know, preset sessions and session rooms. It was really a bunch of interested people would get, you know, people who were interested in a, in, in a set of mutual concerns would get together. They would, on the morning of the event, come up with some stuff to talk about, and they would break off into groups and talk about it. And so that kind of unconference, um, what's, you know, come to be known as an unconference, um, and there are different ways to run these, and everybody's got, you know, kind of ideas about which are the best way to run these. And that camps actually um, are run in a lot of different ways. But, but, but the, we can kind of put all of those different ways of running these, these events under this term, unconference. Um, that, that was the model, that was the model we, we chose. Um, so in 2008, we, uh, we put out a call on the web, on Twitter, on our blogs, um, saying to people, if you'd like to come to CH&M in June um, and talk about stuff, uh, let us know. Like, and really, we did it via email. It was like, shoot us an email. Tell us what you think you want to talk about. Um, and, you know, book your plane ticket or, you know, get in your VW bus or, what, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever your, your, your preferred mode of transportation is. Um, we used uh, rooms at the university that nobody was using um, on, on Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, and Sunday morning. Um, uh, we, uh, we hosted 60 scholars at that first, that camp of, well, 60 scholars, librarians, other kinds of, of, of um, people who do digital humanities. Um, the whole thing cost uh, 3,000 bucks. Um, we recovered almost all of that through small donations. We literally passed a hat at the beginning of, of uh, on Saturday morning, and um, you know people threw in 10, 20 bucks, whatever they could. We recovered most of that 3,000 that way. Um, a couple of organizations who thought it was a good idea stepped up and gave us a couple hundred dollars to pay for breakfast. And so for $3,000, um, we got 60 people together for two days of great conversation um, and a lot of work getting done. We gave them breakfast and lunch both days. So you don't get that at most meetings. We gave them free coffee, as much as they could drink. Um, everybody got t-shirts, everybody got a badge. Um, and we were even at enough money left over to give two student travel stipends for 3,000 bucks, right? So not hundreds of thousands of dollars, $3,000. 
And sort of to our surprise, um, after we did another one of these things in 2009, um, some of the attendees decided to, and really without any coaxing of ours, um, very spontaneously, some of the people who had attended the that camp in 2008 and 2009 decided to host their own and said, hey, can we you know, use the that camp name and do one in, the first one was in Austin, uh, the second one was in, uh, in East Lansing. Um, and, and in, so in late 2009, um, there were a handful of these kind of locally organized grassroots events that did the same thing, you know, found some rooms, came up with a little bit of money, bought some coffee, invited a bunch of people to come and uh, talk about, uh, about uh, issues of mutual concern. Um, I mean, there were a couple reasons why this went viral. Um, one is that, again, it's digital humanities, and there's a kind of, there's a kind of, it fits, you know, it fits well. The, the openness, the, the the hackiness, the the um, the decentralized nature of it, it kind of fits well with the culture and the ethics of digital humanities. Um, uh, you know, the 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 fact that people in the digital humanities often had heard of these kinds of events before um, through you know, the Silicon Valley tradition of bar camps um, helped. But I think mainly what made this go viral was the fact that it didn't cost much. It really, what it costs is a very enthusiastic graduate student. I mean, somebody who can, and somebody who's, whose enthusiasm can attract participation. And then, and then a little bit of money as well. Um, but that, what it really takes is, 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 is some, some time, we say about 100 hours, um, and commitment. So somebody's got to spend 100 hours on this thing, and you know, somebody's got to get really psyched about it um, to pull it off. But other than that, anybody can do one of these. And I think that really, the low overheadness of it allowed this thing to, to, go, to go viral. In, in 2010, um, we uh, got talking to the Mellon Foundation about this thing. Mellon was interested in providing what Don Waters was calling at the time um, digital humanities training at scale. Um, he wanted to figure out a way to train scholars, non-digital scholars, in the basic, you know, kind of basic training for non-digital scholars in the in the in the kind of methods of the digital humanities. And he wanted to do this, you know, he didn't want to fund, you know, give somebody $500,000 to bring 100 scholars to a university for three weeks in the summer and, you know, really train. What he wanted to do was give, um, you know, somebody a small amount of money and figure out a way to train lots and lots of people in the very basics. Um, and this kind of mapped very well onto what, you know, he was talking about this, so we got to talking about it. It mapped very well onto onto what he his aims were because we had you know a kind of low cost model and and something that was was scalable. Um, this was something that was extensible. It would prove in that you know this can this can happen anywhere for very low low cost. Um, even though we had at that time had only had you know there had been less than ten of these things probably. Um, so Mellon gave us a little bit of money um, by their standards. A very little bit amount. I don't have to be cagey about it. Two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars for two years um, to kind of extend this thing and to add a training component to it. Um, and basically, what that money has that money paid for uh, paid for three things: one, developing the training component; uh, two, um, providing very small five hundred dollar travel stipends to graduate students uh, to go to these things, so that you know pay for a hotel room and gas kind of travel stipends. And then, um, and then most importantly, pay for Amanda French, our uh, regional coordinator, to not to run that camps herself. Um, certainly, and she, she doesn't run them herself. Um, she has in a few, in a few cases. Um, but to provide support and guidance and answer questions and kind of organize a community. She's really kind of like a community organizer for this group of people who wants to, who wants to run, run that camps. And um, the realization there was we had kind of created an invisible college, an invisible society of, of, uh, of, of that campers, that these people, this had become a community, and this was something, we, this was a community that we could grow. Uh, and it was, the idea was to, to make that society, that college, 
more visible, um, to, to, to institutionalize it just enough so that it could be extended, um, but not to create the kinds of overhead um, that, that you know, the, the, the scholarly societies and the scholarly conferences against which that camp really was, and it really was against which that camp really was uh, originally um, envisioned. Um, so so we're, we were, you know, this has, been, over the past couple of years, the last two, three years, this has been a process of making something which started really as a, you know, completely spontaneous grassroots or effort invisible in a way to kind of make this more visible, um, just visible enough so that it's sustainable. And in fact, we just got another round of funding from Mellon. It will be our last, another 250 grand, um, our, our last uh, money, that's, that's the last money we'll get from them um, to make this fully self-sustaining and to kind of set it off from the nest. You know, we, we don't want that camp to be a CH&M thing. That camp is really something that was you know, we, we had the idea, the community ran with it, and the community should, should own it. And so we're going to, um, you know, take what has been something invisible and make it, and make it visible and viable and sustainable um, in the community. You know, and in doing so, um, we've kind of adopted the, some of the hallmarks of the scholarly societies against which we had originally defined ourselves, right? Like, now we're like, you know, this is how this happens. <laughs> Things are institutionalized, um, and, um, and we're becoming institutionalized. Um, but, but, but what we're trying to do, though, is to take on some of the hallmarks of those scholarly societies, the things that, as Jim Grossman said, people want us to do, but without taking on the structures, without taking on the overhead. And so, a couple of the things we're doing. Um, the conference, the annual meeting, I mean, really it's just a, it's a structure, right? It's not an end in itself. It's a, it's a vehicle for face-to-face -face communication among members of the profession. Um, and so, we want to accomplish, that's what the membership wants, quote, wants us to do provide a, a venue for getting together. And so we're going to try to do the same, we're trying to do the same thing, but we're doing it through 100 distributed events, and we just passed 100 that camps. There have been 100 locally organized that camps around the world. You know, we've had our first one in Asia, is probably going to come off in Saigon. Um, we've had Australia, uh, New Zealand's not on the map. We've had, um, uh, you know, Half of the states, 20 countries, have had these things. So it's really, I mean, this is distributed. And so, I mean, what's great about this, the reason why it's kind of, we were, we've been able to do this at scale, um, people can go to these things. At first, people were like, oh, how am I going to get money to get a plane ticket and get a hotel room in Fairfax to the, go to that camp? Well, you know, now there's a that camp near you. You know, you, you probably don't even need a hotel room. There's one probably within driving distance of you um, at this point. And uh, or there's one that's in con that's going on kind of nearby or in conjunction with another meeting that you're you're probably attending, and so we're we're actually piggybacking on that scholarly uh, society structure. But this is another model for providing face-to-face -face communication for vast numbers of vast member you know vast numbers of of, of members of the profession, right? So we don't have to all we don't have to bring everybody to San Diego. We can bring the conference to them. <laughs> So hallmark of scholarly societies, but without the structures of scholarly societies. Right? The journal, again, the journal is a structure. Um, it's an institution. Um, but it's an institution with the goal of you know, distributing high quality written communication, written, written, um, written articles. Um, the journal's not the goal of, it's not, it, the journal is not what people want the scholarly society to do. It's they want a vehicle for the kind of content that the journal provides. Um, and so instead of a journal, um, we've had blogs. Again, it's kind of a more distributed model. Um, people um, blog in connection with all of the that camps or most of the that camps. Um, they create Google Docs, collaborative Google Docs, as notes for sessions or as session proposals. Um, they blog on their own blogs before and after that camp with ideas and, and other things. Um, 
And, you know, some of this is really half baked. Uh, some of it is uh, more fully baked. Um, some of it becomes more fully baked as as people think about it and as the conversation uh, continues after the conference. And um, nope. And to uh, to to facilitate that, um, we are and we can talk about I think we can talk about this more in the in, in the, the Q&A. Um, we're going to take the best of all the stuff that's produced uh, in connection with that camp on all these blogs and Google Docs and just kind of all over the place. Um, we're going to try to gather this together, provide some kind of peer review, peer review is probably too strong a term, vetting, assessment, um, and to wrap it up into a kind of journal called Proceedings of That Camp. Um, but it, but it's, it's not going to be a kind of standard journal with submissions and stuff. It's we're going to go out and find good stuff out there or have people nominate good stuff that's out there. And we're going to roll that, you know, every six months or so, we're going to roll that into uh, a kind of published uh, volume in connection with our press forward effort, which we can talk about as well. Um, so kind of this publishing thing that associations do, um, we're going to do some of that, but without the kind of overhead of, of, of the journal. Um, membership, again, this is another thing that these, another structure that, that scholarly societies employ. Um, what they're really trying to do is provide community and professional development for, for the members. Um, we provide community instead of a membership, we provide social networks. So. Um, the, the membership of that camp exists primarily on Twitter. Um, it's the community of people who follow that, the that camp hashtag. Um, and you know, all the, all the that camps, we made a decision early, I mean, we had actually a, a pretty big debate about this early on, um, whether each that camp should have its own hashtag or whether everybody should use the that camp hashtag. Um, we landed on everybody should use just plain that camp um, to the extent, you know, not everybody does. This is a distributed community. We can't tell people what to do, but, but we encourage people to use just that camp because what that allows is for people who aren't at, you know, that camp Luxembourg to kind of follow what's going on at that camp Luxembourg. Um, and so there's always stuff being posted at the that camp hashtag. Um, Certainly there's, you know, normally at this point there's a that camp, you know, two or three a month. So almost every weekend there's stuff being posted. But um, even when there's not a that camp ha happening, people are posting stuff in connection with that camp, you know, things that they've written after that camp, uh, links that they've uh, uncovered after they've gone to that camp that relate to something they were talking about at that camp. Um, and so there's, 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 a, there's a kind of membership, a, a group of people who are connected by a hashtag. Um, and that... That, and if, if that camp is, is anything, it is, a, it is a community. I mean, it's a membership. Um, and in that way, probably more than in any other, aside from the conference, aside from the journal, um, that camp is, is, is becoming more and more like a scholarly society. Um, professional development. Um, in connection with the Mellon Grant, we created a new thing. You norm, you, that camp, when it first started, happened on Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, we created a new thing called that a boot camp, which would, was a one-day training program, slightly more structured. There would be there's a there is sort of an agenda. There are instructors um, who provide four or five sessions uh, in ba basic training in in digital humanities methods. Um, again, the, the the curriculum isn't set. People. The, the organizers can set the curriculum, they can teach the skills they want to teach or the skills that they have access to um, or the skills that, that their attendees want to learn about. Um, uh, but, but we kind of invented a space, this Friday space, for people who wanted to provide some more structured training. So this is our professional development component. Um, we talked about committees. Um, we've got our committees as well. Um, you know, it's a very loose structure. Um, right now, uh, that camp is kind of run, um, you know, in some ways it's a, a benevolent dictatorship with Amanda as the dictator. Um, but she has a kind of uh, Politburo of camp counselors. These are the people who, um, who uh, uh, organize camps um, and they exist on, a, their, their primary interactions are on a listserv where they ask and answer questions um, of one another. You know, I'm planning a that camp. 
how do I pay for breakfast? Um, I'm planning a that camp. Um, is it better to use whiteboards or uh, easels for uh, for scheduling? You know, whatever whatever it is. Um, and they guide the kind of direction of that camp. They keep they keep that camp running. They they uh, allow for new blood for people, new organizers to come in and 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 get and get uh, answers to their questions. Um, and they kind of maintain the values and the ethics and the and the practices, the kind of culture of the organization, in the same way that you know committees and governance, other governance structures in in, uh, in scholarly societies do. Um, this is sort of centered around Amanda right now. Um, this activity, these conversations. Um, she's the moderator of the listserv. In effect, it's an open open listserv, but she's, she's, she's kind of the moderator. She does a lot of answering the questions. We don't want to be in that position long term. As I said, this is our last grant. We don't, we, we don't want to own that camp. That camp's owned by the community. We want to set it free. Um, and so over the next two years, one of the big things we're going to be working on is setting up a coordinating council to take over the, the, the management of, of that camp, to be the governance structure, to replace Amanda. Um, as the as the center of this uh, of this community, um, and that's going to be made up of um, mainly, you know, the, the real kind of that camp geeks, the the people who go to lots of that camps and organize that camps. And it's weird. There are people who like travel to these things. It's a little. It's funny. It's like I, I thought I had this. I had this. I. Um, thought the other day it's like it's like dead shows kind of like there are people who travel to these things you know there are people who like you know i i, I went to one dead show that was enough for me you know like i got it and I, it was cool and i, I like the music but that was enough um but then there are people you know who've gone to 100 dead shows and 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 that's cool too same with that camp there are people who go once and say okay nice um, and then there are the people who like travel around and then go to they've gone to like 20 of them and it's and and so we're going to try to you know recruit that enthusiasm for to 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 maintain to maintain the um the organization in general so while we're taking on the hallmarks of scholarly society we're trying to do the things that scholarly societies want to do and do the things that the the membership of those organizations value um, the big difference is well, all, while their operations, while the main, the big scholarly, the traditional scholarly societies, their operations tend to be centralized. Ours are all decentralized. That's the big, I think, the the big innovation. If there's an innovation from that camp, it's this decentralized um, structure. And there are a couple of analogies you can make. Um, you can uh, make to airline uh, travel routes, travel networks. Um, the kind of old hub and spokes model of United and American and the big old line airlines um, to uh, to Southwest and AirTran and these kind of upstart, JetBlue, these upstart airlines. Uh, the old airlines use a kind of hub and spokes model, the new ones a point to point model. So here's United's um, route map um, and you can see like they, um, you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, Houston, those are their hubs and all of the traffic, most of the traffic goes into and out of those hubs. So if you want to go from, you know, from Charlotte to Los Angeles, you go through Houston, right? And you change planes in Houston and, and that's and that's how it and that's how how it works. This is Southwest's route map. Um, very different. Um, they have all point to point flights. They will fly from they will fly from um, you see, actually, it looks like a hub, but it's not. It's just that Las, everybody wants to go to Las Vegas. But if they want to, you know, if, if there are enough people who want to go from Phoenix to Seattle, they'll have a route going from Phoenix to Seattle, um, and it'll go direct. Um, if there aren't enough people who want to do that, they won't do it. But the, the key is, is that the, the, the relationship of all these cities to one another is uh, these, are, these, these, peop these cities are interested in one another. There's only a route if there's a lot of people in Houston who want to go to Chicago, then there's a route. Um, that camp is very much like this, that, 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 that the relationships are peer to peer. They're between the people. If the organizer of that camp Charlotte meets the organizer of that camp Orlando, um, they have a relationship. It doesn't go through the hub of Amanda necessarily. They can, they can, they can organize a that camp on their own. They can answer their own questions. They can do, do their own thing. Um, 
Another example of, of this, another analogy is, is between the, the, the telephone exchange versus the internet. Again, like the telephone exchange, you know, the calls go in, this operator puts the, you know, connects the call. All the calls go through this, go through this operator versus the internet where, um, you know, there's not one big honking computer sitting in the Pentagon where all traffic goes through and somebody, you know, flipping switches or, or, or pulling plugs. Um, traffic is routed through individual servers on the network hopefully in the most efficient way to get traffic from A to B. So it doesn't go through, there are, there are the, the, these, are, these are countries, um, the, the hubs. I mean, there are, there are places where there's more traffic and less traffic, but the traffic doesn't all go through a, any kind of, of central, central hub. Um, that camp's like that. That camp is a community that has its own relationships. It, we have, there, there really should be no central office. Um, that camp is, in that way, web native. That camp looks like the internet, and to the extent that um, to the extent that that camp is um, successful on the internet, successful in the internet age, to the extent that that camp um, kind of meets the crisis in scholarly societies uh, better than some of the scholarly societies have, um, it's because that camp works like the internet. That camp meets the challenge of new media um, sort of seamlessly, organically, because it works like new media. Um, new media is not a problem for, for that camp. It's just the way that camp works. Um, that, camp is, that camp is web native. Um, I've always said in running digital humanities projects, um, building websites, um, the websites that work are the ones that work the, the, the digital humanities projects, the web, they're the ones that work like the internet. The ones that fail are the ones that fight against the internet way of doing things. I mean, and, and it's, it, you, can, you can see a failed project and a successful project, and, and most of the time it's because one tried to fight against the internet way, and the other just adopted the internet's values, ways of working, you know, traffic routing patterns, all of that. Those are the ones that succeed. Um, and to the extent that that camp has succeeded in the internet age, it's, it's for that reason. Um, I've done a lot of bashing of scholarly societies, um, and, I, and I don't mean to. I mean, these are invaluable organizations. Um, they, they still have a huge role to play. Um, and in fact, we spend a lot of time working with them now. Um, we, we, they, they are coming to us, we're coming to them to try to, um, you know, help them deal with these, these crises that, these crises that, have, that the internet is, is causing them. Um, increasingly, the big scholarly organizations and the little ones are having that camps. They're adding unconference elements. They're either having that, like that camp AHA, like, a, like an actual that camp in connection with the conference, or they're adopting some of these ways of working to try to meet some of these challenges. And we, and we you know, want to work with them, work with them to do that. Um, we define that camp in, in, in opposition to the big scholarly conferences, but our intention was never to knock those, those things down. Those will serve a role. Um, it, but it was just to try to imagine, on a very small scale, um, a new model, a new model that kind of was web native. And um, you know, hopefully we've done that, and hopefully that's a model that, um, that other people can learn from. So thank you. And, uh, Happy for questions. Yeah, I'd love to say. So I'm going to uh, field questions and pass them along. And please do remember to use the microphone so we can capture your question. We have some takers. Good. I'll take. <laughs> if I can stand. <laughs> Uh, hi, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm Mark Phillipson from CCNMTL, Center for New Media Teaching and Learning. Uh, nobody mentioned the Digital Campus blog, which I really enjoy listening to you, um, oh, and I recommend to everybody here. Um, I guess my question is about the journal part of that camp and its intended audience. Um, as you think about what this thing will be, um, and, and I connect that with some of my interest in the difficulty in conveying the work of digital humanities. Um, and um, 
So I'm wondering whether the reader of that journal will be brought into some of these processes that you're talking about, or, or it will be sort of an in-flight magazine for people who are already in the community. Um, and, and will it be more than just sort of snapshots of what happens in those fertile weekends, but maybe some sort of demonstration about how that connects to larger projects that develop over time and have some sort of impact? Um, yeah, uh, great, great questions. Um, well, uh, the first thing to say is this thing is in its infancy, and we, and the answer to most of those questions is I don't know. Um, I, but um, I, I think, you know, we are going to throw a bunch of stuff against the wall and see what sticks. I think that's, that's actually, and that is a very that camp way of working. Um, so initially, I think what we're going to do is, because we've got a big backlog of stuff, um, you know, produced from these hundred camps, um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to just really just start organizing and putting out that stuff. Um, and uh, by turns, we're going to start opening up. So, so that process, I think, is going to be pretty closed. To begin with, because we want to actually, you know, produce something and put it out there and and see what people, how people use it, how people want to use it, what what which people are using it, um, and then and then to iterate on it. So, our our philosophy with the journal is that we're gonna take a bunch of we're gonna find a bunch of stuff that's good, good writing, good stuff that's been produced at that camps. We're going to wrap it up um, and we're gonna put it out there, and we're gonna iterate. Um, and we're going to invite the community, um, whoever that is. Uh, initially, it will probably be mainly people who are, you know, that camp regulars, enthusiasts, whatever, um, to to make suggestions, to tell us, well, you need to open up your peer review model, or you need to, you know, your selection model is wrong, or you know, or or you know, you need to try to reach a larger audience. Um, and I think so. I think that that the that the proceedings of that camp you get in August when we when we put out our first issue uh, is going to be very different from the proceedings of that camp that you get in say 2013, 2014. Um, so we're going to try to solve those problems, those questions, answer those questions um, pragmatically. Hi, I'm Ann Jonas from the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, and I'm curious about how in the that camps you've kind of dealt with the tension between building on what you've already talked about and kind of not having the same conversations over and over again, while also being able to bring in new voices. And I kind of wonder if you, if you have any best practices for the ways that you try to do that, or if it happens organically, or if you see that tension or, or not. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see that tension. Um, the same conversations happen over and over and over. Um, that is, you know, every that camp has two or three conversations about tenure and promotion. I mean, you know, inevitably. Um, so yeah, so they so they do uh, have um, the same conversations over and over and over again. Uh, I think the first thing to say about that is, in one respect, that's not bad. These are conversations that lots of people want to have, need to have. Um, and so, you know, let, let them have them. Um, on the other hand, I do see, I, you know, I think we want new stuff to come out of that camp. We don't want it to just be, you know, 2008, you know, Groundhog Day over and over and over again. Um, and so there are a couple of things that, that we've done, I think, to, um, to try to encourage that. Um, and I think the big thing is the realization that we should encourage um, two kind of specialized kinds of that camps. The first one being these disciplinary that camps that are often tied to um, big scholarly meetings. So that camp AHA, where you know they talk about history and things that are of concern to digital historians, but not necessarily to you know um, uh, digital lit people. Um, or you know that camp 18th century studies you know that was another you know so so there there are these kind of very kind of specialized that camps which deal with issues of concern to a smaller uh, community not the whole community of, of DH. Um, the second thing we've done is um, 
so so there's there's these disciplinary ones, and then there's thematic back camps. Um, and when we first started this, I was really against this idea. I was like, no, like it should just be that camp. You know, it should just be. It should be anybody should be able to talk about anything. There shouldn't be any constraints on the on the program. Um, and and then I realized, or I was I was schooled um, that there still aren't really constraints on the program. Um, you know, just because it's labeled that camp 18th century studies, like the culture of the thing is such that if somebody starts talking about, you know, the 16th century, you know, no one's going to get really offended. Um, and, and people go and people from outside those disciplines go. So, so, so the other thing, so, so I was against this, but, but we've, we've also started these, so the disciplinary ones, and then, then also the thematic ones where, you know, there's a that camp theory, which doesn't make sense to me because that camp's a pragmatic thing, but there's going to be a that camp theory, which is great. Like, and that's the beauty of that camp. People can, if they want to have a strong focus on theory or that camp pedagogy, um, that camp games. Um, there have been, so if people really want to talk about games, um, there's a that camp feminisms. Um, you know, so if, you know, if people want to talk about issues of gender in particular, well, great, you know, they can do that. Um, just so long as it's open to everybody and nobody's excluded and, you know, people aren't going to be, um, aren't going to be, um, made to feel excluded because of the disciplinary focus or the thematic focus, then, then that's, that's great and that's worked. And so that has, I think, helped to kind of focus people's um, minds on and do, to do new things that aren't just the same old DH conversations that, you know, everybody's heard before. Please use the mic. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, Bruce Shenitz. Uh, I at Pratt Institute and expect and hope to get my MSILs next month uh, for to be a second career uh, information professional. I'm curious about the fact I noticed in your uh, slide of, of a, I don't know if that was the first that camp or an early that camp. I'm guessing that the population was largely junior faculty and grad students. And I'm also guessing that uh, demographically it skews in that direction. So the question would be, do you see this as having an impact on the entire system of tenure and promotion, the tendency toward uh, permanent adjunct faculty? Does that come up at all at the that camps, or do you think it's you know do you think there will be an impact? Uh, yeah, I mean it's talked about a lot. So first of all, the first thing to say is it skews young. Um, that's for sure. Um, uh, it skews a little male, um, and it skews a little white. Um, it skews less male and less white probably than a lot of scholarly uh, uh, meetings, but, but yeah, it still does. And, and um, you know, but again, like, what's nice about it is we don't have to solve that problem centrally, necessarily. Um, we, you know, there are you know, there's a working group on diversity in that camp. Like, they just started this group, and they're doing it, and they're trying to figure out ways to encourage more diversity in that camp. Um, you know, there's a that camp, um, historically black colleges and universities, so to try to solve that that some of that that problem. Um, so, so, so the diversity thing, you know, it's a it's a real it's a real real question. Um, in terms of you know diversity, in terms of um, position and hierarchy and um, it's a pretty good mix, actually. Um, you know, it skews young. I mean, I don't, you know, there aren't a lot of, you know, octogenarian faculty there. Um, but there are plenty of full professors, uh, you know, in their late 40s type, just made full kinds of people. Um, and then there are plenty of adjuncts as well. Um, and and more, and more adjuncts than you'd get at, a, at maybe a, a an AHA meeting where, you know, there are large registration fees and, you know, there's, you don't really need department support to go to a, a that camp. So there's probably more kind of adjunct faculty. There's also way more um, librarians, museum professionals, um, kind of alt-ac types, um, you know, people who have lots of training in the humanities, lots of uh, who work deeply in the humanities, think deeply about the humanities, um, but don't have kind of traditional faculty positions. Those people are there too. Um, you know, I, we are trying to break some of the down some of those hierarchies. 
Um, what we don't talk about, I think, that much, or what we, what I don't worry about that much, or and maybe I should, is trying to fix the problem of adjunctification through that camp. Um, I'm, I, I think we're more concerned with just saying like, you know, everybody working in academia is valuable. Um, everybody working in the humanities in whatever capacity um, should be heard. And at that camp, you don't have to worry about your position. We're not trying to like necessarily, you know, help you help help you get promoted to to a tenure track. We're just trying to say that we're, we're but we do try to recognize that an adjunct is as good as a full professor. Hi, Tom. Uh, just a quick question. If um, are you aware of any scholar or graduate student who is actually looking at that camp um, as a community, sort of doing a research project around that camp? Uh, no. No, that'd be good. <laughs> I would love to see it. Um, yeah, no, I don't know of anybody. That's a good idea, though. Any adjuncts, I mean, any graduate students are listening to this, um, we'd be happy to help you with that. Hi. Um, my voice is terrible. Sorry. <laughs> I have a cold. But um, thank you for a really thought-provoking talk. And, and I can't help thinking, looking at the history, as a historian, looking at this phenomenon that you're participating in, um, looking back, as, as I listen and look at what that camp is doing, it makes me think very much of something that flourished greatly during the 1990s, which was the Seth Summer Seminars. I don't know if, if you were thinking about that camp, that has informed at all what you're doing, if you're very familiar with that phenomenon, but what Susan Hockey and her people at, at Rutgers ran for a number of years. It was a, it's a little bit more formal in some ways than that camp, but still a pretty loose community building thing. And of course, it didn't go viral. So on one hand, there's that historical precedent. And I'm curious to know what you think about that. And if, if I can stick in one other piece for the, the current thing, I'm wondering if you've looked at analogous phenomena yet in a way you talk about this being an expression of the sort of culture of the web. Uh, I can't help thinking one of my staff members is very active in Occupy Wall Street. And as I hear him talk about the kinds of organizational principles and methods that they pursue, and as they begin to undertake some pedagogical activities, whether you see some parallels, whether you see this very much as a, as a, a, a kind of analogous sort of phenomenon in terms of the organizational uh, principles that it's turning to on the basis of people's participation in the web. Yeah. Um, so. So uh, there's sort of three things there, I guess. That I mean, the first one, the first thing to say is that you know we're in the, I guess, fortunate position, digital humanities. Um, you know, there's an argument over whether it's a discipline or not, but whatever. Um, but we're in the fortunate position that we're new and that we're trying to establish our kind of disciplinary structures now um, in the changed information environment. Um, you know when these you know when AHA was founded when um, when MLA was founded the, they were these organizations were founded and their structures were developed in response to and in in and and in you know in in the information environment they were the scholarly communication environment and um, the needs and opportunities that they were faced with we're doing the same thing um, it's just that you know those needs and opportunities have changed and and it's just easier for us to react to that change. So this is a, you know, I mean, this is a part, this is another chapter in a story of discipline building. And, and, and so there's a lot of precedent from the 19th century and from the early 20th century. Um, in terms of other kinds of precedent within the academy, um, we, weren't, we weren't looking at those consciously when we thought of this. Um, but I do think there is a lot of precedent. Another thing I'd point to is like the Burks Conference, um, you know, which is is you know kind of you know or is kind of an organic thing that grew up and has become a, an important structure in a, in a, in a, in a subdiscipline, um, but which wasn't necessarily kind of intended People that way. People may not know what the Burks. Uh, it's a women's history conference, um, and it, it is it, it you know in some ways was was started in response to you know the gendered interactions that happened at the other big history conferences, and it's become a thing unto itself. And you know, in many ways, it's like that camp. It's a it's a it's a movement. Um, Dan Cohen likes to call that camp a movement, like the Olympics. Um, you know, and, and and so so it is it is in a tradition of those kinds of movements. Um, so it's got a kind of 
disciplinary analogies, movement analogies. Um, the third thing I would say, though, is uh, yes, um, Occupy Wall Street is a kind of similar phenomenon. I mean, the values of it, I think, are, you know, there's, there's some analogies there. Um, but it's also the way it's organized. I mean, it's, it's an internet phenomenon, you know, it was organized, again, kind of around a hashtag, um, you know, the Occupy hashtag. Um, it, it's very distributed, um, you know, the, the, the Occupy, the governance is this kind of loose consensus governance. Um, so yes, there are a lot of analogies there. I think the, the, the analogy we were most conscious of um, was to open source software communities, which are organized in very much the same way, communicate via the internet, very, you know, kind of rough consensus is their model for governance. Um, so we were very much aware of those those communities as open source software developers ourselves. Um, and the two guys who, who really spearheaded this in 2008, um, Dave Lester and Jeremy Boggs, who were grad students and, and, and uh, developers at CHM at the time, um, those guys you know, are op members of open source developer communities. And, and so that was very much in our, in our minds um, when we started. So I, I do think there's, there are a bunch of things that grow out of internet culture like this. I actually have a question. The one that camp that I've been involved with was was that camp publishing, and so not a scholarly society model as much as a sort of professional sort of society. So there were people from university presses, there were people from library publishing operations that are all very new, and we were more or less trying to figure out how to use technology, how to learn what we needed to know to do to do our jobs. Um, so it wasn't really about a discipline as much as a sort of job structure, kind of you know how do we actually do this. And one of the challenges we face, especially as we're sort of trying to extend this out into the university press community, is that because of that camp is web native, it can be hard to bring in people who are not web native. And so those people in the university press community who don't tweet aren't in the gang. And it's very hard to, to explain to them what's going on, to say, oh, you're just going to post your idea on a blog and we're all going to deal with it when we get there, what the, what the schedule is. I mean, that, it, it's really hard to, to kind of move, even though there's a huge need for this kind of loose um, learning about the, the technology that you need at the time that you need it. That's really valuable. Organizing the event is challenging when you're not dealing with net natives yeah so how do you how do you address that or can you um yeah it, it is it, it is difficult it is it, it it can i think um feel like and and we've got you know we do surveys after that camps a lot um or the the the, the, the counselors do um and a pretty common comment um you know it's not certainly not the majority but there's always a couple people who sort of say like i felt like i was in a foreign country like, I just, I, I, I don't get it. Um, and I, to be honest, we haven't come up with good ways to deal with that. I would love from your experience to, to hear some ideas. Um, you know, an, an, a very common, a very, very common criticism is, you know, Twitter. We use Twitter. We, I mean, as I said, like, if, if, if that camp is anything, it's a Twitter hashtag. <laughs> like, it's a community that is organized around a Twitter hashtag. And so if you're not on Twitter, um, it, it can be tough to be part of that community. Um, I, I think, you know, we're, again, trying to have these, these that camps in connection with particular groups, particular dis sub-disciplines, particular, um, particular topics is one way we're kind of trying to deal with that. One of the things we're going to be doing as part of the next kind of two years in trying to um, spin this thing off is we're going to build out the that camp website. Um, so most of the individual, one of the things we did in the first kind of Mellon grant was one of the support functions we did was we set up a WordPress multi-user instance um, so that grassroots organizers wouldn't have to like have their own server and launch their own. They could just host the website, which you really need for the camp, um, on our server. We're going to build that out using the tools that uh, CUNY Commons in a Box is providing to try to bring a lot of the social network I mean, not away from Twitter, but to to do to to have another channel for that social networking that happens on on the blog, um, so that if you're not on Twitter, you can kind of do it there. Um, that's also going to help with the proceedings because while the the proliferation of Google Docs um, and other 
other products that people produce at that camp is great, and there have been some amazing things produced. Um, they're also hard to track down, so we're trying to kind of roll some of that into the, 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 the system so we can then identify it, edit it, you know, make it good, and put it out there. So, um, but, but yeah, I, I think this is a real, this is a real pro kind of two cultures problem and, and um, something we, we need to crack. Oh, I'll say one more thing. I, boot camp was kind of part of that too, uh -huh. um, where you know boot camp was designed, and there were and the fellowships that Mellon gave, um, and actually they weren't just for graduate students. They were for, well, be, Mellon being Mellon, it was like for people working at four-year institutions. You know, I mean, it's like you know, like <laughs> if you're at Columbia, fine. If you're at community college, no go. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but but um, you know, you you. Um, it, it was designed to get traditional faculty, graduate students, people doing traditional work to that camp. And a stipula stipulation of their financing was they had to go to boot camp. So they had to do the kind of, you know, here's an introduction to RSS. Here's an introduction to, uh, to XML. Here's an introduction to, you know, Omeka. Um, they had to do those training parts to, to be able to go. So that was a, an attempt to kind of roll in some traditional people. So I uh, attended the uh, publishing that camp via Twitter, and clearly any number of people can attend that way. Is there a, a natural limit to the physical that camp? Uh, does it get too big? Um, yeah. Uh, so for we sort of say the optimal size is between 50 and 75. Um, over 75. Yeah, it's it gets really hard to manage. Um, that camp, the one at CH and M, which has been called that camp Prime, that camp CH and M, we're we're now we're we're moving to a convention where we just name uh, use Roman numerals like the Super Bowl. So it's going to be that camp V, that camp Five. Um, uh, that one is bigger. Um, that one's going to be probably close to 175 this year. Um, and, you know, we, we can do that because we, you know, are kind of expert at doing these things now. Um, but if you're trying to run your own, um, I would try to keep it to 50 or 60 to, to be safe. Yeah. Sorry, this is just, a, um, you mentioned at the beginning that you were going to talk about some upcoming back camps around here, and I don't believe that came up, so I was oh. hoping. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, right, so there's. Um, we have the internet. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, if you want to figure out, I want to see what's coming. I mean, this, this is like, I, I really do not know um, <laughs> where, where, the that the that camps are going to be, but they're all these are upcoming that camps, and then there's then all the archived ones are below. So um, there's one at Penn, and the University of Pennsylvania doesn't mean you can only go if you're from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but museums NYC, um, there's one in Buffalo, then there's one in October. Um, that camp theory is going to be at Rutgers. Um, so and there's one in one Lehigh. Um, so there's, you know, there's a bunch, and then Bo that, there's Boston, there's going to be a that camp, New England, I believe, again. So, like, there's probably, in the next year, six or seven in, you know, in dri good driving distance. Or you could fly to Saga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to go to Luxembourg, I wanted to go to Florence. <laughs> we made the mistake of not building travel money into our melon budget. Um, so we don't actually get to go to any of these things, um, but I guess that's appropriate for a distributed event. Okay. Anyone else? Well, there are still refreshments at the back, so we can have a casual conversation. 